I'm Mark Morton and in this video I'm going to use the term video tutorial to describe any kind of video that you create in order to help someone learn outside of a classroom. The first thing to know is that a video tutorial can contain two kinds of content real-world material and screencast material. Real-world material is obviously the kind of stuff that a video camera or an iPhone captures. It's a recording of something that has happened in the real world, like a birthday party or a dinner gathering. Screencast material is a recording of activity that has happened on a computer screen, along with the voice of someone who is commenting on that screen activity. When you create a video tutorial, it can, of course, include just real-world material, or just screencast material, or both. You might, for example, create a video tutorial that first shows a real-world segment, such as a lab assistant setting up a lab specimen for analysis. Then you might follow that with a screencast segment showing the data from the analysis as it appears on a computer screen. With a tool like Camtasia, it's easy to combine those two kinds of material. From a pedagogical perspective, there are several advantages to using video tutorials to help students learn. First, video tutorials are a very efficient way of conveying content. Content that might take 20 minutes to deliver in front of students in a classroom might take less than 15 minutes to deliver in a video tutorial. This is because in a video tutorial you can edit out gaps and also because you're often working from a script or something resembling a script. Second, students can watch a video tutorial as many times as they want to. They can slow it down. They can pause it while they take notes or think about some aspect of the content. They can review it prior to a midterm or final exam. All of these things can especially benefit weaker students, students with certain learning disabilities, and students whose native language isn't the language of instruction. Third, in a video tutorial, you can zoom in on especially important parts of the content. For example, you might zoom in on part of a microscope that would be too small to see from the middle of a classroom. Or you might zoom in on a topographical feature in a satellite image of the Grand Canyon. You can also add other enhancements to a video tutorial, such as arrows, text boxes, title slides, and so on. Fourth, and probably most important, if you deliver content to students outside of class by means of video tutorials, then you can use class time for more effective active learning activities. In other words, instead of using class time to deliver lectures or presentations, you can use class time for question and answer sessions, discussions, debates, demonstrations, peer instruction, application exercises, and so on. These kinds of in-class active learning activities result in deeper learning. Using video tutorials in this way is called flipping the classroom. Those are advantages of video tutorials from a pedagogical perspective. From an administrative perspective, there are also advantages. First, once you create a video tutorial, you can use it over and over, from one year to the next, or at least until it becomes out of date and you need to remake it. Second, you and your colleagues can share with one another the various video tutorials that you make. Why reinvent the wheel? If someone else has already made it. Third, if you upload a video tutorial to an online learning management system, that system can give you data on which students have watched it, which ones haven't, and so on. You can also use video tutorials in conjunction with online quizzes. Students watch a short video tutorial, answer a short online quiz based on that video tutorial, watch another tutorial, another quiz, and so on. On the other hand, there are also some caveats pertaining to video tutorials. First, they take time to create. A 10-minute video tutorial could take two hours to create, depending on how much editing and enhancing you want or need to do with it. 
However, the process does get faster as you get more practice. Second, you need to be aware of accessibility concerns. For example, students with severe hearing impairments won't be able to hear what you are saying in a video tutorial. Accordingly, you should be prepared to at least provide those students with the script you used when you created the video tutorial. Alternatively, you can add captions to your video tutorial. If you use a good quality microphone and speak clearly, there are tools available that automatically turn your voice narration into captions. You'll still need to edit the captions to fix any errors, but voice to text programs are getting more accurate every year. Third, you need to be aware of copyright concerns. You might want to include a clip from the movie Titanic in a video tutorial for your history course, but you probably can't. If you're unsure, you should consult the university's copyright and licensing librarian. Let's turn to best practices for making video tutorials. In terms of content, the following types of content are especially suited to video tutorials. An introduction to content that you'll be expanding upon later on in several classes. A summary of a multi-day or multi-week unit that you've finished covering in class. Content that is especially challenging so that students can watch it several times. Remedial content, that is, content that the students should already have acquired from previous classes. For example, in a second year English literature course, the instructor shouldn't have to use class time explaining how to use a semicolon. Instead, that remedial explanation can be delivered in a video tutorial. The students who don't know that material can watch it, and the students who do know it can disregard it. Content that you have to deliver over and over. For example, if you're teaching a cell biology course and you need to show several sections of students how to prepare a slide, then it might be a good idea to introduce students to that process via a video tutorial. Content that is highly visual in nature. For example, a presentation about different kinds of geological formations would probably lend itself to a video tutorial better than a presentation about tax law. If you want to find images that you can freely use, you can do so at several online sites, including Flickr. Just search for images with a Creative Commons license. Responses to student questions. For example, if you run out of time in class to respond to your students' questions, you might invite them to email the questions to you, and then you could create a fast and dirty video tutorial in which you respond to those questions and which the students would watch before the next class. More best practices. Use a good microphone and take time to adjust its levels and to position it correctly. If your audio is scratchy or not loud enough or full of popping P's and hissing S's, you will annoy and lose your audience. Put some thought into whether you should use the picture-in-the-picture -picture technique or not. The picture-in-the-picture -picture technique is where a small video of you appears in the corner of the screencast parts of the video tutorial. The advantage of this is that it can help personalize the material. The disadvantage is that it's just one more thing to think about as you're making the video tutorial. Be yourself. Don't try to sound perfect like Peter Mansbridge from CBC's National News. Remember, Peter Mansbridge has a team of dozens of staff helping him do everything for his broadcasts, from makeup to sound, scriptwriters, editors. You don't have that kind of support, and even if you did, it's actually more effective for you to sound like your natural self. Your job isn't to perform, but simply to explain. If you misspeak while recording a video tutorial, you don't need to edit it out or start the video tutorial over, unless it's a huge mistake. Instead, just correct yourself and move on. Doing so will actually make you seem more natural and authentic. Limit the length of your video tutorials. They should be 15 minutes or less. If you have a lot of material to cover, then make two or three video tutorials instead of one long one. Listening to a presentation in a classroom takes a lot of focus and attention. Listening to a presentation in a video tutorial takes even more focus and attention. Write a script before making your video tutorial. 
The mere act of doing so will make it easier for you to create the video tutorial because it will force you to develop a pathway through the material. Once you have the script, you can read it word for word during the creation of your video tutorial, or you can just use it as a guide or outline and speak more freely. When it comes to your audio delivery, there are two extremes you want to avoid. You don't want to sound like you are simply reading something because that will sound like you aren't really present. And, on the other hand, you don't want to sound too casual, like you're just speaking off the cuff. Aim for an informal and friendly, but professional tone. Make sure you sound interested in your own material. If you use video tutorials to flip your classroom, that is, to deliver content that students are supposed to watch outside of class, make sure you find a way to ensure that they really watch it. For example, at the beginning of class, you might give your students a quick quiz based on the content of the video tutorial. If your students use clickers in class, this quiz could be done in less than three minutes, and the clicker system would automatically tabulate all their responses. Alternatively, you could require your students to complete a brief online quiz based on the content of the video tutorial in the course's learning management system and prior to coming to class. If these quizzes collectively are worth a few marks, it will motivate students to watch the video tutorials. One more thing, if you do use video tutorials to flip your classroom and some students haven't watched them before class, don't reteach the material to them. Doing so will only make them less likely to watch the video tutorials in the future. Okay, that should be enough to get you started in making video tutorials. Your first one might be a bit rough, but keep at it and you'll quickly improve. This is the end. Yeah.